Well, hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwa the Fourth. You know it, Chief of the Little Republic of Akwemu Edumasa. And this is our favorite day and our favorite hour where we get inquisitive, but positively inquisitive. And I've said this, and I'm sure I sound like a broken record, that, you know, some time ago, most of our mentors had to be foreigners. You know, all the good stories and the dreams and things you aspire to do had to be about people who were far away from you, who had different cultures and brought up differently. But, you know, thankfully, we have now grown to be a bit selfless, if I may say. So we have Ghanaians who have chalked good feet, achieved great miles, and are willing to tell a story that inspires somebody, that tells somebody to keep going, that tells somebody to stand fair. And I think it's no mean feat at all. You don't take it lightly, because most people like to keep to themselves. And I'm telling you that if God has blessed you, no matter how it is, it's very important that you sort of share a testimony so that somebody out there who may be facing a similar challenge would also turn around or know within themselves that, you know what, forge forward and that all is not lost. <clears throat> and that's how come we do personality profile because you know what, everybody has a story. Each and every one of us has a story in us and that story you should never go to the grave with. We tell that story to inspire somebody. That's why we're here today. I'm here to talk to somebody who is an author, international development practitioner, a chartered accountant, and a passionate Ghanaian, if I may say. And after so many years of working outside, has decided, you know what, I am going back home, just like many of us, to make it better instead of this usual brain drain. So folks, I'm here to talk to Marek Kofigan. Amazing story of a guy who <coughs> started his life, quote unquote, as a scientist or in the science era, got to university and said, you know what, this is not my dream. Can you believe it? So what was his dream? Well, that's why we're here to listen. Stay tuned. When I come back, I'm talking to Marek Kofigan. Don't go. Well, thank you very much for staying, and this is uh, the favorite part of, uh, of the show. Uh, Marek, let me say thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, well, welcome to Personality Profile. Thank you for having <laughs> me, and appreciate it. Marek, let me take you all the way back to Keta, because uh, with first appearance, somebody may say that, ah, oh, look at him, he's just <laughs> touched down in Kotokan, <laughs> doesn't even know <laughs> what Yokogari or <laughs> Banku and Okro looks like, but we, we may be very deceived. Very, very deceived. <laughs> <laughs> so, born and bred in Keta, right? Yes. Wow, Born and bred in Keta to uh, an engineer that, uh, a trading mum, but I lived with my grandparents in Keta. Okay. I, I literally grew up with my grandparents in Keta, um, right on a coconut plantation, yeah. uh, right in between the sea on one hand and the lagoon on the other hand. Yeah. Um, so we would go fishing on the uh, sea, and if there was no catch, we would go to the lagoon. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's interesting, because back then, it was just basic life. Um, it's only growing up now that I realize seafood is actually luxury. <laughs> 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 um, but that, that, that was, that was, um, that was a very beautiful time of my growing up. Um, and I remember back then, way back then, uh, some ships would come dock, you know, and have all these white folks come aboard and then go back. Uh, so it was a really, really, really interesting time of my growing up. Um, I remember going to the AME Zion School, which was all, all of those are in the sea now. In fact, my grandparents' uh, house is all in the sea now. The Whoa. last time I was there, uh, there's nothing of that left. Uh, there's a whole heritage that has been taken on by the sea. Uh, but yeah, beautiful, beautiful uh, 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 growing up. Just being, uh, are your grand folks, are they Presbyterian? EP? My, my grandfather was Presbyterian. Strict. <laughs> Very strict. <laughs> um, my grandmom, on the other hand, was uh, uh, Roman Catholic. Okay. Uh, very, very dedicated Roman Catholic. Wow. Um, so there was always this fight in between my grandpa asking us to go to the EP church. 
and my grandma trying to force us to learn how to count the rosary or read the rosary. Um, so there's always that, that you know, internal domestic uh, pool on either side. Uh, but yeah, I think we tended to go more with my grandfather, okay. which is more Presbyterian and uh, the more, uh, more hard side of things than the Roman Catholic, more relaxed. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> I just, I, that was just inquisitive. <laughs> but so, uh, dad was an engineer? My father was, uh, yeah, an engineer, building technologist. Okay. Uh, yeah, and he traveled around a lot. Uh, so how come you, that's how come you were staying with grandparents? Or? Well, yeah, initially that's how come I stayed with grandparents. Mm -hmm. And then at some point he asked me to join him. So I was the only one with him from age eight, seven, eight. I, um, if I remember well. Um, and from then on, it was travel, Liberia, um, all the way. Well, finally, we ended up in Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, which is where I grew up all the way till I think year 13. Um, so he was the type who gets bored easily. He does one project and it gets boring. He wants to move to the next country, have the next experience. Uh, um, so we traveled quite a bit in Africa, okay. uh, ended up in Nigeria. Um, um, and um, until he decided he wanted to come back to Ghana um, and then we were all shipped back home which is how come I came to start my secondary school here in Ghana um, back again to Kita. So it's almost <laughs> like an in and out thing for me and Kita. Okay. It's almost, I mean, but the thing about Kita secondary school which is why I ended up was because all the men on his side of the family uh, I don't know if it was a tradition, but most of the men went to Kita Secondary School. Okay. So it was almost <laughs> as though it was a thing you the, had to go the, to Kita Secondary School. My destiny has <laughs> already been carved out. You had to go to Kita Secondary School. Uh, and it was quite fascinating because the school had an album. You could almost see a whole generation. And I saw my dad in the album, which is wow. quite exciting. <laughs> just, um, so yeah, that's, that's me back and out of Keita in Africa and then back again to Keita. What, what, what was Keita Secondary School like those days? Oh, Keita Secondary School back in those days was... Um, so I went to the, to the old system, which is yeah. O-level, A-level and, and all that. Uh, and it was quite fascinating because when I went into school, I was... So you had all this... And back then you had all these grown-ups who were actually your seniors. Yeah. You know, you couldn't... You know, I remember seniors who used to come to school during the week and over the weekend they went to their families because they had families. Uh, <laughs> Um, so it was, it was quite, and then the SSS started when I was there. So it was quite a, a big shift. Mm -hmm. um, and we got bullied a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember I got like locked up in a cupboard. The the yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 so, I mean, there's a few of my seniors back then mm -hmm. who I used to dread. Um, and I see them to then. Yeah. We're, we're pretty much on the same <laughs> level. Um, I remember some who used to cut the under of my chop box oh dear. Um, and take all my oh, shito and my sardines and everything. <laughs> but I think it's some of the things we all went through. Um, but, you know, those things shape you up. They, they shape you up. Let me divert a bit and come back to it. You see, our children today would probably be very traumatized if, if they went through If they system. went through that, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and back in those days, you couldn't complain to anybody because no, the you, next person you, you're going to complain to is probably worse. You know? So, <laughs> so was, you just live it. was actually it. expected that as I'm going to this school, I'm going to be homeowed. And then, right. you, had, and then you had the dreaded right. seniors that everybody yeah. knew they were yeah. tyrants. Yeah, yeah. You go into the school and the first thing you know is you, you just pick up some names. You know, you just know. So when you say you're going to this dormitory, the first thing you ask is who is the senior in charge of that dormitory? It's, it's quite traumatizing. But at the time it was still fun because um, I think the expectation is you know your turn was going to come. You were also going to be a senior at some point. Uh, uh, unfortunately for me, when we became seniors, they put a ban on the whole bullying thing because the SS students were coming in. It was quite dreadful for us because we felt, you know, this is our time. Um, and how, how dare you just stop us like that? Um, so I had a few of my colleagues who attempted the bullying thing and were sacked from school. Wow. Uh, wow. That's how hard it was. Uh, wow. Yeah, so we felt we lost out because we got bullied. We never got to bully. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Get to pass the baton. I know. Over. 
Uh, but exciting times. Uh, it was. They it shaped was, you up. It yeah. was. We, we even had homo's nights. I mean, it was literally yes. homo's nights. Yes. Well, you all got dressed up funnily. <laughs> <laughs> Shipped off together. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. I remember Homo's that. Night. Well, those days are I remember gone. that. So from Keita then uh, to Lagan? Um, hmm. Interesting. So, <laughs> um, sixth form. Mm. Um, I won a sixth form first year. Um, did very well, and then I flopped at the end. Mm. Um, and my father, who thought, if I don't do something to this guy, he's not going to get his grade for sixth form. And so he took me to his village, uh, uh, told me we were going on an excursion, took me to the village, uh, asked every, unknown to me, asked everybody, no privileges for me, treat me like a typical village boy. Mm -hmm. I have to be called to go to the farm, do the weeding, mm -hmm. do everything. I did that for one week. <clears throat> my hands were sore, my feet were sore, and then a day before we returned to Accra, he took me to a big piece of land and said to me, son, you see this piece of land, that's mine. My father gave me that, but I chose to learn. That's how come I'm not farming here. But if you don't pass your sixth form exams, your A-levels, this is where you're going to come. And that shifted everything in my mind. Then we came back to Accra, uh, well, came back mm -hmm. to school, uh, wrote my sixth form exams, A-levels, uh, passed it, got accepted into Legon to read chemistry. And, and that was a really crucial moment for me because all along I had been studying science. And I'd been studying science because all the men in my family were science background people. And I felt it would be really out. I, I felt I would disappoint my father if I did something other than science. I mean, I had to prove manly, you know, <laughs> uh, do science. But I got to Legon campus, first day on campus, and I realized... The, the, the shock or the realization, now listen, I could have been on this farm with the whole... Yeah. Uh, did, did he let you go back to read or did you still rebel? No, it actually changed my whole perspective of our life. Because then, at that point, I saw alternatives. Mm. One alternative was, yes, I was going to be at home. Father was going to take care of you. You don't have to worry. And the other alternative was, actually, this guy is not going to take this nonsense. If you mess it up, he's going to ship you out. Mm. And for me, that was the first time I saw that side of my father. It was that side of him that said, you know what? Yeah, we can be joking. I can be playing your face. We can be laughing and all that. But this is life now. Beyond six form is life. You, you can't mess around anymore. And so it hits you. It hits you that, you know what, you know, this is a father who, who laughs with everything, but, you know, there's a side to him that is serious. And so you had to take life serious at that point. Um, so that was, that, was, that was a really changing moment for me yeah. to actually see my dad in a, in a different perspective than just a friend. You know, um, so it is shipped a lot. After a week of digging and hooing and fetching up, your drinking. And, and I think the sore <laughs> hands made me really see. <laughs> a, life, a lifetime of yes. this is going to be tough. Yes, and I think uh, that was really practical because mm. he made you see that this is a lifetime you could have of sore hands. Mm. And I, I dreaded that. I really dreaded that. It was practical enough for me to see. Wow. Yeah, I dreaded that. It was different from being told. Mm. This is me experiencing and I said to myself, nah. Not this sore hands. I mm. can't do that for a lifetime. So yeah, um, go back to the books. Go back to the books. <laughs> so I, I chose. I made a, a choice there. Mm -hmm. I think it was a really. That's what he wanted to import for me. You know, yeah. to be able to make a choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's that choice that needed to be made, um, and I did make the choice. I think I made the right choice. Um, so that was exciting. Uh, so from to, flopping in lower six, did you, were you able to I, take when I made up my grades <laughs> <laughs> within the shortest possible time. Um, I made up my grades, which is, which is really exciting. Um, but I had to. You know, at that point, you, you, I went back to campus. And I'm like, you know what? Forget about the whole friends thing, you know, guys, boys, boys mm. thing, girls thing. Forget about it because I've seen what my future looks like and I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I looked odd to my friends because suddenly all this bubbly yo-yo guy yeah. suddenly is all switched on. You know, he has no business with, oh, let's go mm -hmm. hang out, let's go do girls. Mm -hmm. That totally changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's really shifted something in me since then. Wow. You know, it's, it's the perspective about what life could look like, uh, you know, worst case scenario. 
Um, and it's 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 been. Um, I dreaded it then, but I think it was a lot of good. Defining moment. Defining yeah. moment. Wow. Absolutely defining moment. Wow. I I wish a lot of parents would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish a lot they of parents. Show them what the reality yeah. would be like. Yeah. yeah. I remember his younger brother. Um, he was also an engineer in Ohio. Um, brought his son back to Ghana because um, he was acting. So he brought his son back to Ghana to have a look at, you know, what things could look like. <laughs> I don't know how that ended, but I remember he went through that process as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a practical way of letting kids know that there are alternatives to life and it's, you know, success or not success, it's you know, choice. Um, it's a choice. So you come back, you picked up your grades, you're doing science because, you know, you're in the yeah. science family. Yeah. And you get admitted into Lego. I got admitted to read chemistry, wow. which, which was, um, back in the days, it was even, I mean, just getting a letter from the uni to say you've been admitted was like, that's, that's a life achievement, mm. you know. Um, and I had that. And then I got a chance to actually stay on campus. That was another achievement at the time. Um, because you remember there was a backlog. Mm. So it was really hard to get into uni yeah. at the time. But I got it. Um, I've actually framed my admission letter. Um, <laughs> I have it in my office. I've actually for, framed my for admission letter. For posterity. <laughs> um, because that in itself was also a defining moment. Mm. Uh, so I, I go to campus, uh, took me with a driver with my stuff in the back, went on campus, and uh, right then on the first day, I didn't even uh, stay the night. Right then on the first day, I, I said to myself, God, I'm actually going to be reading chemistry for all the rest of my life. Is that what you really want to do? And right then it dawned on me that, you know, I knew I had been acting up to be acceptable to my father mm. and the rest of the men in the family. But it just dawned on me that from this point onwards, there's no turning back. You're on your own. You're on your own. If you read chemistry, it's going to be chemistry for the rest of your life. Is this what would make you happy? And I realized right then it was not. I forced myself to do chemistry. Uh, interestingly, from Form 1 to 3, the subjects I was really good at were accounting, literature, and history. Loved them to bits. Loved them. I didn't make an effort. It was just my thing. It was me. That was me. Um, and then I realized that, you know what, from that point onwards, it was going to be all those things behind me and it was going to be chemistry. And I dreaded it. It was, it was a really uh, a big eye opener. Um, so I was left with a choice. Me, the driver, and a decision whether or not, <laughs> me, the driver, um, and a decision whether or not to go forward with something you would not enjoy or to go back and pick something you absolutely love doing. At this point? At that point. Wow. And I knew the implications, you know. Um, um, and exactly as I thought, I, I asked the driver, you know what, let's go back home. He begged. I remember so clearly he begged. He was like, are you sure you know what you're doing? Even he's going to be in trouble. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so are you sure you know what you're doing? I said, let's, let's go back home. Um, so we went back home and my uh, family was... My mother could have murdered me on the day if what? she had the chance. Um, what would mom call you, Kofi? Kofi. <laughs> what, what are you doing? Um, she was livid. Wow. Um, and you know how mothers of the day, <laughs> so she wrapped her cloth around <laughs> her chest and goes, you and I will sleep at the Legon today. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's funny now, but back then, then I remember where I stood. I stood right by the kitchen door. And she was by the room divider in the living room. And she was like, we will die today. You and I will go back to Legon and we will die there today. You've got admission in your back home because... Nye, 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 nye. It, was, it, was, it was a whole... Standing there talking uh, about my dreams. It was crazy. <laughs> it was... Um, I would, see, it, it's a long time ago, but the picture is so clear in my mind, you know, because, um, I mean, this was... This was like... A whole family investment, you know, you go into uni. And I was the first one to be going to uni because my, my bigger sister chose a professional path. Okay. Um, so it was a big thing. This is, this is the hope of a whole family, <laughs> you know. Um, 
So it was a really divided house, totally wow. divided house. So my, my kid brother and my father were on my side and, and um, everybody else was <laughs> against me. And it was, it was tough. Mm. It was mentally, it was tough. It was tough because... Um, I mean, African child don't have visions and dreams. Yeah. You follow the path. Yes. That's you do what dream. you're told to do. Don't largely. go to university and come and no. tell us about your dreams. No. And back then was a big thing. Ah. You have to become a scientist for the family. What are you talking about? You know, you can't just walk up. So it was, it was, it was a dreadful, it was a dreadful three days. Wow. Yeah, the day I came back, and the three days after that, my my father, being the man he was, didn't say anything. Wow. He didn't say anything the first day. He didn't say anything the third day, and that made it even worse, because I didn't know whether he was on my side or on who. He just kept quiet. You know, he didn't talk to me, he didn't say, he just kept quiet. Um, at least I knew where my mom stood, which was okay. Um, at least I knew I had... We're going to die, we're going to die like I mean, it was good to know that I didn't die the first day. And the second day, you know, my life was literally handed back to me. Um, I don't remember being asked to come and take my food, though, even though I managed to eat. But uh, it was a dreadful three days, and I remember it very, 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 very clearly. Um, and then on the third day, my, my dad called me and said, so what do you want to do? Let's, let's hold on there. Let me take a break <laughs> here and come back and hear what you wanted to do <laughs> after. But hey, the amount of people who are at that crossroads, I can imagine the number of people who are at that crossroads, who are just hoping for that boldness to just you know, go back and say, look, this is the part I want to chat. We're coming back. Well, thank you very much for staying and we're talking to Marek Kofigan and well, this is a business person cloaked as a scientist pretending to be a business person, if, if, if it makes any sense. But I was watching this drama and this woman was doing this funny thing and somebody asked what is this? It's a man dressed as a woman pretending to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> Could that, so that, enough. yeah, you know, so that, that, that calls you and says, so what do you want to do? Yes. Um, and for me, just him calling me and saying, what do you want to do? That, that alone was the greatest relief at the time. Um, so I said to him, you know, you know, I used to do well in the, the business and art subjects. He said, I know that but you made a choice to do science. I didn't force you, so I couldn't have stopped you. I said, yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to doing what I thought I was good at, mm -hmm. which was to uh, study accounting. Um, and said, do I want to do that through a degree program, which meant I need to go back and write an A-level for business subjects before going back to apply, which would have set me back another two years. Mm. So I said, no, I'd rather jump into the professional stream. Uh, and back then, ACCA was the one of choice. Because mm -hmm. um, um, I already had this background of traveling with him a lot. And so I wanted something that, even though I could practice with in Ghana, also gave me an opportunity to travel if the opportunity arose. Um, so I went to do ACC and the first thing he said to me was, do you have any idea how difficult that program is? I said, yes, but you know, it's what I, 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 I believe I want to do. It's the line I think I was always cut out for, so I wanted to do it. Um, and he said to me, you do know this is a huge commitment than just going to uni. Mm. I said, yeah, because you had to pay in pounds, in the <laughs> British pounds sterling. Uh, the subscription, the books, uh, the registration, mm. and then the membership. So it was five big things you had to pay for on an annual basis. Um, and for me, uh, that even just made my mom even more crazier, because it's like, OK, you've got your uni, which you would have gone to, and that would have been minimal cost. Now you're going to load us up with all this British pounds. And at the time, you know, paying British pounds in Ghana was like <laughs> uh, madness. Um, and so I, I set myself on the course. My dad said, OK, we'll give it a shot. I'm going to say this to you. There was three levels at the time. 
I'm going to give you one year to pass your level one. If you don't pass it, you're on your own. And so I knew the lines were drawn. <laughs> because that was the only way he could negotiate with my mom that we need to give this guy another chance. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to, you know, pass that. I, I needed to. There was no... Um, so I remember very well, um, I went to a, a private um, entity run by the then Reverend Dr. J.J. M. Mate, uh, who at some point ended up being the IPS um, uh, director. Okay. Uh, so he taught me accounting to start with. Um, and it was quite fascinating. The first day he saw me, I was like, so you left uni to come and study accounting. Are you sure you want to do this? I said, yes, sir. So we started a journey. Um, and I came back home first day at, on campus, his campus, um, and put a, a bold note on my door, no disturbance, studying. And I would lock myself in the room all day. If I came out, I was to either have a bath or grab my food and went back in. It was me and the books. Wow and a wall. I remember my table faced a wall because I just wanted to look at that wall all the time. Um, and um, I did my SSCA in three years, Max. Wow. Which back then was a record. I mean, now people do it quite uh, often. But back then, it was, it was quite a thing to have completed this year within a record of three years. Uh, uh, you determined. Yeah. You ha I had to be. I mean, there was no messing around. I had to be because this was, this was me in the balance here. It was my destiny and the whole family's expectation. You know, it was a big weight on my shoulders. Um, and it drove me. It drove me right. Because it's uh, a lot to learn. It's a lot. It's a lot. And considering that between Form 4 and 6 Form, I hadn't gone back to studying accounting okay. within that and then suddenly you had to go all go the way back. back but but I knew that was what I was cut out for I knew it um, it was I knew that was what I was cut out for that and anything to do with literature it was what I was it was what was in me you know you can't shake that off um, uh, it just happened that I made that realization at a very crucial time mm. uh, both for the family and for myself so so yeah I did as you see a um, um, I remember the day the final result came through. Uh, my mom was pounding fufu, and my and I was standing uh, elsewhere. And my sister was the one who brought in the. Uh, she went to the post office and brought in the result, and she opened it. I didn't ask her to. She just <laughs> opened it, and when she rushed into the house, she just screamed. Uh, at the time, I was called Charles. <laughs> Charles has made it to, and. I remember very clearly, because I still have the picture in my mind, I stood there stunned. I was stunned because it was such a relief, such an achievement and a relief. And then my mom stood up from where she was pounding the fufu, and the two of us looked at each other. And um, I remember tears rolled down her eyes, and she couldn't say anything. She just stood there, and I just stood here. And everybody just froze in time. It was almost like... Yeah, the end has now justified <laughs> the whole wahala, you know. Um, so I, I walked up to her and um, she hugged me, which is it's quite it's a beautiful moment, a beautiful moment. And um, before I knew it, my dad was on the phone calling his friend, the lawyer, and everybody else to say, my friend is now, my son is now a chartered accountant, <laughs> which, is, which is quite uh, fascinating. So, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy story. Wow. Oh, wow, 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 wow. I mean, would you, I mean, would you advise people to, you know, at the crossroads, make this decision or it's not for everyone? I think everybody should. Look, you, um, life is quite short like that. The last thing you want to do is to go through every single day of your life doing something that is not you. It's, 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 um, and I know there's quite a number of people like that. And the tendency is to think, oh, I have come this far already. Why would I want to go back? Um, and I think what most people don't realize is that even if you had already used up 30 years of your life on the wrong track and you had just 10 years left, 
you, you might just find yourself amazed at what you could achieve within those 10 years would far surpass all that you've done in the 30 years. Mm. So it's not really about where you've come to now. It's about what, you know, it's, life is all about what you can get yourself to achieve and accomplish and be proud of and be happy doing. Um, so the journey forward doing what you love to do or what you're most wired to do, uh, you can't, no matter how long you've lived on the wrong road, you cannot compare the two. It's, it's totally incomparable. Wow. You've got to love what you do. Um, it's the only way you can do it to the best of your abilities. I mean, I, I ended up in international development, you know, um, and up to today, I wonder, because there's not a lot of us black folks in that environment, uh, you know, let alone practicing my field in that space. So it's, for me, that's, that's huge. For, for the young ones watching, I mean, who's an international developer? Um, <laughs> so international development is, is quite a, a varied um, soup, uh, mm -hmm. but largely involves... Um, how do I put it? Largely involves going with or into countries that are least developed um, with knowledge and funding and uh, diplomatic support to sort of help change um, the status quo in those countries, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's economic. Um, so uh, in my case, for example, having lived in the UK, it was largely about taking funding from European and UK governments uh, going into uh, uh, sensitive environments uh, or conflict environments, which turned out to be my specialty, and helping the economies recover, helping the social environments recover, helping um, you know lives recover. Um, um, so in Congo, for example, it was about helping to rehabilitate kids who have been through the war women in Burundi who had been raped and needed to get a life back. Um, in South Sudan, for example, it was about rebuilding an entire health uh, uh, system for the country because everything had been wiped off mm -hmm. by war. Um, so it's, it's exciting. Um, it's exciting. It's, you don't find a lot of our folks in there a lot. Um, uh, but for me, it's exciting because you know, I say it's the closest I get to being in a movie, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember once being shot at in, in South Sudan, which was exciting. I would say it's scary. I, I find it exciting because, you know, um, it's, it's the closest you get to being in a movie, you know. Um, um, so so it's, it's, it's different context, different environments, you know. Uh, um, I remember one incident where we almost got... Uh, so I, I went to uh, the north of DRC, Bukavu, mm. with uh, a colleague, uh, um, uh, a Portuguese colleague, lady. Um, and one evening after work with some child soldiers and all that, we decided to take a stroll. Um, and I remember we were taking a stroll, just the two of us, and she was wearing a skimpy little skirt. It didn't cross our minds. And before we knew it, there was a group of boys following us uh, with machetes and guns and all that. And it never really crossed us because we thought, oh, this is the community we've worked in all this while. They, they know us. Um, and it took the country rep in his jeep to come whisk us away. And then we saw them running. And then he said to us, don't you ever do that again. And so we've, we, we asked why, and he was, you know, these guys have been starved of, you know, things like sex and all that for all this while. The next thing you know, you'll probably be chopped off, and they'll take the lady away, uh, which is quite scary. Wow. I, I think it was more scary than being shot at, because <laughs> you literally see your life yes. whisk in front of you. Um, so I find that exciting. Uh, those are stories I hold dear, uh, you know, close to life, close to death, mm. uh, right in the middle. Uh, you know, but for me, as, as somebody who had practiced finance in, in, a, in a firm, a consulting and audit firm, for me, it was beautiful because you tend to be able to see how your work is impacting on people. Mm. You know, you can see a whole economy change in front of you. You can see a whole society evolve in front of you. Um, and and that's, there's nothing more exciting than that. Uh, so apart from the usual administrative work of managing funding and managing uh, resources on behalf of uh, 
taxpayers in Europe and all that, which was, you know, that was a technical side of my work, um, over 20 countries in total. Um, that's, that's exciting enough, but I think nothing compares to actually, aside doing that, being in the field, to actually see how um, your planning, your projects you've developed in-house are, are impacting on people's lives and helping change uh, people's uh, destinies. Let me, um, let me throw one in on the lighter side. There's this, sure. there's this movie, and I've forgotten the actor, but he sells ammunition to conflict zones. Oh, um, right. I think I remember. Yes, that. <laughs> and he's, he's sending a shipment to Is it to a god of war? So, uh, uh, right, and, right. And then they call and said, oh, we have a truce now. He gets very angry. <laughs> because his ammunition are locked on high seas. Yes, I think I remember the movie. So he says, <laughs> I'm taking it to the Baltic. The Baltic yeah. goes, when they say they're going to find it. Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you mean a truce? Yeah, <laughs> He's yeah. taking it to the Russians. Yeah, the, when they say they're fighting, they fight. <laughs> I remember that movie very well. It was a beautiful movie, actually. Actually, very well captures what goes on in the field. Yeah. Um, that yeah. and um, uh, something diamonds. Um, uh, blood diamonds. Black diamonds, black diamonds, I diamonds. think is yeah. the one. Um, it's, it's, I'm sending it back those are the really, really yeah. uh, real yeah. life. If you're um, saying they fight, they fight, they what fight. Do, what, what yeah. do you mean the truth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so that, I mean, I, this is on a lighter <laughs> note, but I mean, you turn on the TV and DRCs and the coffers are, ah, well, that's it. That's a business opportunity. Let me go there and yeah. try and fix something. Yeah. Even though I don't wish them yeah. bad, but hey. But you know, it's interesting you say that because it's not only we who want to fix something who go there as an opportunity. There's also people who come in there because war always generates an economy. Mm. You know, uh, yes, it's war. Um, some people are losing, but some people would also gain. Mm. You know, so you have all this multilaterals who would come in because, you know, um, it's, it's a war situation. People are not thinking right about, you know, the economic value of what they have, and mm. it's an opportunity for them to come in and get it at very cheap rates. Um, so partly we who want to go and save lives and we who want to go and change things and also those who want to come and bring down what we're doing. So it's, a, it's kind of balancing act. <laughs> uh, but those circumstances really shape your thinking. Yeah. Um, whether you're practicing economics because, it, you know, it forces you to be able to carry out policies and all that within the most uh, craziest of environments. And if you can do it in those environments, you can do it anywhere else that is calm because, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's one thing to balance, you know, deploying policies in a war zone. It's another thing to deploy and write and deploy policies in an equally stable zone. Kofi, you see, uh even in a normal environment, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you hear oh, they went on the bond market, they couldn't get enough money and they come back. <laughs> and so then you're asking, so in, in, in this terrible zones, are there, <laughs> is there money available for these, you know, sensitive situations? Oh, there's money. There's always <laughs> money. <laughs> there's always money. Um, and it's, it's quite, um, I, I hate it when I have to say this, but... Um, and I know people, and I have my own ideas about uh, people saying there's money going into this environment, but there's equally the West taking money out of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I think what I would always say is that, fine, that, that is the case most of the time. But it's also sad to realize that the monies that go into this environment to help these people are not coming from largely with the Africans, even mm -hmm. though it's, these things are in Africa. Mm. Uh, or Southeast Asia in some cases. It's not coming from the indigenous uh, continent. It's coming from outside. So, yes, we can make the argument that, you know what, there's money coming in, but there's money also leaving. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think the moral justification to be able to make the argument about money leaving is to be able to say we're the ones taking the money in, you mm -hmm. know, um, but that doesn't happen. So there is money to be made in those places. There's also lives to be saved. There's also economies to be rebuilt. Um, and it's it's a mishmash of you know some of the uh, the craziest things you can find yourself in. Well, Kofi works with uh, the uh, Crown. Used you, to used to work with the yeah. Crown agent, and is also an author. And one of the books that I want us to talk about <laughs> is Business with God, and that thing is a. Very intriguing title. So stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break. And then when I come back, we're talking about business with God. Don't go away.
Well, thank you very much for staying, but, uh, you know, business with God. I like the title. But before we do business with God, I mean, we in Ghana here very much aware of crown agents. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're politically savvy in Ghana, you know, you've, you've heard of crown agents. But, I mean, what is it like to work for multinational like that? How much experience do you get and what training? I mean... Oh, a lot, a lot. I mean, uh, I think Crown Agent, I've worked with different organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I think my two favorite are the Commonwealth of Nations Secretariat and Crown Agents. I think Crown Agents has totally uh, shaped me professionally mm -hmm. and in general. Like, but because they take that seriously, they take uh, building uh, value in people very, very exceptionally seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, a thing I've liked, I've loved about Crown Agents is that it's a huge organization, it's a massive organization um, with different segments to it. There's logistics, there's uh, economics, there's uh, uh, international development, um, and there is um, uh, professional development. All, and I've actually been, you know, privy to uh, be part of all those. But that opportunity is there to be able to uh, run yourself if you're willing to grow, that mm -hmm. is. Um, but the other thing they do critically, which I'd love, is that, you know, mostly people rise to positions using their technical skills. And they, you get to a very high level and you realize it actually takes some exceptional level of soft skills to be able to uh, manage people and yeah. manage situations and, and move uh, uh, departments forward. Um, and for me, that's been one of the things that Cranogens has done exceptionally so well. So instead for of me. basing, instead of depending on just your technical, technical skills, skills, you the, get shaped up with soft skills as well. And I think having the like two communication, makes you, like communication, like critical thinking, like uh, uh, you know, uh, planning and strategizing, you know, all these skills, they. Um, they, they, they make you whole, if, if you get what I mean. So it's not just about your technical abilities. It's also about how to manage organizations and how to uh, manage people, which but, are the two crucial things. So, um, are you, but, so in, are you using that now? Or you I, am, I, I have accumulated a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm using it now. I, I think what I try to do these days, which is one of the things I'm doing in Ghana now, is to be able to uh, uh, move uh, people to be able to acquire more soft skills as well. So, for example, I deliver some level of corporate uh, uh, improvement or training for people who want to acquire some uh, critical soft skills like uh, strategic communication, like uh, critical thinking, like creative problem solving, uh, like planning and uh, strategizing. Uh, and I think we need that even the more because mm -hmm. um, the way the world is going is about being able to position yourself in the future. And it takes a certain set of skills to be able to... Have you to, helped any companies yet? Um, <laughs> are, you, are you allowed to say? I, I am, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, but I've oh, helped not, quite a few. It's I've, not, um, I've it's done not, a couple... It's not direct. It's not. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've had some interaction with uh, the VRA, okay, uh, strategic yeah. unit. I've had some interaction with Vodafone, uh, which okay. is quite exciting, and, and a few others as oh, well. Okay, um, so I think, you know, the companies who know that they need these things are stepping forward. To, to ask for these things. Um, and I think any company needs these things. I otherwise always say- be, Otherwise you'd be wiped out. <laughs> <laughs> and for the companies who don't think they need it, well, they'll, they'll soon be wiped out. I, I think they would be. Yeah. I mean, because the competition is getting really tough mm -hmm. and you always need to be a step ahead. I, I always say it's, it's better to have um, a lot of leaders within an organization than a lot of managers. Uh, it's two different mm -hmm. things. You know, okay. uh, managers just manage. Leadership takes, takes you forward. Um, and, I, and I think that's the difference between um, the business environment here and, and out there is that, you know, leaders, they intentionally built up leaders. Wow. Uh, whereas here, largely you are allowed, you're let on your own to evolve. Uh, and that depends on personal effort. It's not systematized. Yeah. You know, the leadership thing is not systematized. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful future ahead. But aside all that you write, and you've written 12 books. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's, wow. <laughs> but the, as a hobby. As a hobby, wow. Yeah. <laughs> 12 books as a hobby. Business with God. I mean, the title is so intriguing. Yeah. What, what are you trying to tell us? Doing business with God. Um, so that was largely me. So there's people who want to learn how leadership works, how power works. Um, 
but don't want to read it with all the Bible, Bible way of doing it. So I've literally taken concepts from the biblical perspective that you can literally digest and absorb in a secular environment. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a Christian. You can be a Christian. You don't have to be a Christian. Okay. But everything in that book about how leadership is done, about how you can play with power or how to manage power, um, is literally sourced from the Bible. Um, so it's written in such a way that if you're a Christian, you would enjoy it because it, it always starts, each topic starts with where from the Bible is being sourced from. Okay. And then the other flip side of the same chapter will tell you how to practically apply it in real life. So if you're not a Christian and you don't want to read the whole Bible side of things, you're you can just read real life. <laughs> can just read the real life aspect to it. If you're a Christian, you want to see the background to it. You can read where it's starting from and how it's applicable in real life. Uh, mm. And I think it's been one of my best selling mm. books. Um, yeah, written in one of the hardest moments of my life, but it's turned out to be the best, actually. Yeah. What's one of the flaws that you have found with particularly Ghanaian leadership? Have you, is there one particular <laughs> flaw that you found that, listen, this is maybe gets into their head too much or <laughs> they, they, they don't listen? Or, I don't know. Um, I, I <laughs> without, without prejudicing anybody, yeah. um, I, I think what I have found, this is, but this is my personal opinion, sure. is that we, we, don't, we don't seem to think 360 enough. Mm. Um, I think when we're doing our thinking, it's, this is the line of thinking we've been used to and so we follow that line. Um, forgetting that whatever you do, whether it's in business or in any form of leadership, there's always going to be different angles to it, different perspectives to it. Um, and you need the skill to be able to look at it from all the different perspectives and then be able to decide this is the way to go. Um, so it comes down to critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And people think critical thinking is just about asking questions. It is not. It's about saying things from holistic perspectives and then deciding, aside all those perspectives I've seen, where is the road to go? Mm. Um, and I think that's crucial. I mean, you know, you're not an old man, but you, <laughs> you've done a bit. Am I not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not an old man, but you, you, you've done a bit. So, I mean, what's the next chapter for? The next for chapter the is, um, I'm back in Ghana. Yeah. Um, scoring the environment. Mm. Um, I have um, different intentions. Uh, one is I'm very passionate about the youth. Um, so I'm currently doing a little project with a couple of youth. Uh, okay. So you'll probably hear of that pretty soon. Um, but then I'm also trying to help the business environment by offering you know, my skill set. Because you've mentioned the youth. Yeah. So that nobody gives me, uh, is, there, <laughs> is there an email that they can reach you on that you want to put out or? Um, so my email, oh, well, it's quite straightforward. My email is ganmarik at outlook.com. Ganmarik? So that's spelled G-A-N-E-M-A-R-R-I-C-K-E at outlook.com. Please, so that they come straight to you. Because I know I'll be getting, oh, I like the guy. Because <laughs> so they can come to you. So, then. yeah. So, you develop so we're doing that. Um, but I'm also, we, we, we're setting up um, um, a training consultancy, uh, personal development consultancy. Yeah, I think that's going to be the bulk of my work uh, this year um, to sort of help entities who want to uh, shape up, you know, their teams, shape up Please, leadership. Sorry, I know you're a visiting lecturer. How, the, how, does, how do you mix that and how, the, how does that work with who? Right. So I'm, I'm a visiting lecturer back in the UK. Yeah. Um, I lecture in public financial management, PFM. Okay. Uh, but those are scheduled courses through all the years. So I go back, I think, once a quarter to, to lecture in public financial management. Um, and it's quite an interesting course because you, you find people within the uh, Ghanaian public sector who actually show up on some of those courses. Okay. Uh, which And all over Africa, really, developing mm -hmm. countries largely, who show up on some of those courses. Uh, um, and I'm a program manager for two of those. So it's, it's still exciting. Which, which institution are you in? Um, still Crown Agents. They have a, a, a professional development unit okay. um, 
very so the, well recognized. They won't let you go. School of excellence. <laughs> um, um, not completely. I, I think the thing Kranigen <laughs> does very well is that it knows, and I'm not only Ghanaian there, mm. but Kranigen does one thing well, which is that it knows how to keep talent. Wow. It knows how to source for good talent mm. and keep them. I, I, I appreciate them for that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that aside, we, we, we're starting a consulting unit here, which is to uh, help organizations to uh, shape up soft skills and uh, skills that take them a mile further um, okay. down the line. Um, and uh, we'll see if I can still write um, um, and maybe have a taste of politics, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You see now. <laughs> No, I don't want to ask you. I don't want to ask you which which party, but which 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 aspect of politics would you want to um, test? I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, I'm I'm very passionate about Ghana. Um, so we'll see we'll see what opportunities come. Uh, I do think I do think it's an area I'm quite excited about. Mm. Um, well, but a day at a time, we'll 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 see how it. Uh, it's where my my efficiencies can best be served, I suppose. Let, let me let me ask you a difficult question. Since yes. you've been with a crown agent and they've shaped you to do things the final way, the <laughs> prim and proper way. Here the we value are. Value money way. You know, and uh, here we are with our politics who have their own world and their own understanding. Would you bend to suit the politics, or you're trying to get the politics to bend to fit into your principles? Because <laughs> somebody has to bend. I see. That's the thing. Uh, somebody has to bend. <laughs> Fortunately, it wouldn't be me, ah. <laughs> because it is you. I, I have never been shaped up to bend. Mm. I, from all the institutions I've been in, you know, uh, uh, Crown Agents, especially, and uh, the Commonwealth of Nations Secretariat, you. You, you you can't bend. Yeah. It's it's become a part of me now. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be hard to bend. I can accept somebody as bending. It just wouldn't be me. <laughs> uh, if I have to bend, yes, it, I can bend. It just won't be me. I can bend somebody else. I, I think I think that I can do well. So we're we looking MP for Keta. <laughs> you never know. You served. You served. You, know, you paid your dues in Keta. <laughs> you never know. Well, I guess you know. Why the, not? The the finest of the finest should be in politics. I yeah, strongly I, believe. I think the best should lead the rest. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, um, I mean, and right. you know, no disrespect, but I, I and I think that's what we've missed so far. Um, mm -hmm. Is that you know most of the people who can make things happen stand outside and feel that you know um, it's too dirty. But it's dirty because the finest are not in there. And mm. that's, that's why it is the way it is. Uh, and I think that needs to start changing. Well, I mean, we look forward to welcoming you into, into, into the political <laughs> space. I mean, would you be under the shade of an umbrella or you'd be riding in there with, a, <laughs> riding in there with an elephant? <laughs> Maybe I just might be walking in between the two. You it's never you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> it appears both need to be guided. You know, yeah. somebody needs to hold the umbrella, somebody needs to guide the elephant. The elephant so bring, you bring, just might bring be in home. the middle there, bring, bring harmony to the system, I suppose. Coffee has been wonderful, it's been interesting. And like I said in the beginning, everybody has a story. And these stories, you know, are what shapes us. And the benefit is that these are people who are like us, eat the same food, have the same melanin in their skin as us. And so their dreams are more real to us than, you know, sometimes you hear of, you know, Richard Branson. And it's a fine story, but there's a distance in culture. So we thank you for sharing a story that thank inspires you. us, that tells us that, you know what, you know, chart the right path rather than living a life for somebody else. Until I come back to you next Friday with the next personality, the number is 024-366-2001. 024-366-2001. That's Tantees, and they make my shirts for the show, so give them a call and get yourself a nice shirt. But thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching.